like it, guys. Well, let's do this. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, Friday here. We're uh, we're doing our Facebook Live here. We've been uh, promoting it for about a week and a half, and uh, you know I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, actually one of my favorite topics in real estate, uh, which is uh, buying real estate with OPM, uh, also known as other people's money. And uh, you know this is one of my favorite topics, probably along with marketing and negotiating, uh, only because I've used uh, OPM and I've leveraged investors, private lenders, hard money lenders, joint venture partners uh, to grow my portfolio. So whether we were buying rentals or we were flipping houses, or even if we were building infills, I, there is no way I would have grown my portfolio and purchased as many deals as I uh, have, which is about 130 properties now. Uh, since 2008, if it wasn't for working with other people or uh, OPM is what we're going to talk about. So there's a lot of stuff I want to cover today. Uh, so I'm going to go right into it. And uh, again, at the end, we're going to be answering some questions for everybody. So uh, if uh, you guys are ready, let's uh, let's do this. So I'm going to just check my phone here again because, again, I'm on Facebook Live and I want to make sure everything's good here working and you guys can hear me. Okay, good, I got a thumbs up, so uh, yeah, let's do this. So here's what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna be covering uh, whether you're in the flipping niche, you're in the rental niche, which are the two most common type of real estate niches or strategies when people are, are uh, buying real estate. And I'm also gonna be talking about when it comes to these two uh, niches, flipping or building a rental portfolio. And again, you can relate, when I say flipping, this could also be uh, building building property. So, you know, building infill, construction and selling it or keeping it, whatever it is. Again, it's gonna be related to using other people's money and uh, some of the best strategies that I've used to grow our portfolio, whether it's the short-term uh, fix and flip or it's the long-term buy and hold. And also, I'm going to be sharing some of the some lessons that I've learned from you know raising over 15 million dollars of capital from people in my network, uh, you know, family, friends, strangers, you name it. Uh, we've raised money from all sorts, and uh, you know, what are some of the things that I've learned from it? So, with that said, uh, let's get right into it. So when it comes to what you need to know, really, when you're raising capital, especially if you're in the flipping niche. Uh, what I've learned to understand is this is going to be your largest pool of money. So if you're a house flipper or you're a builder and you're basically you're not interested in holding properties, you just want to get in, renovate it or build it and get out. Just know that there are more lenders in the marketplace that are looking to lend their money for the short term than there are ones for the long term. And why this is, is obviously because lenders make a very high interest uh, for lending out their money on the short term and because they get their money back quick. Right. And also lenders, they, they like that. They like rinse and repeating and not everyone, but for most private lenders that you're going to be working with, um, they want to know uh, they want to know how your funds are also going to be paid back. And this is usually done upon the sale of your flip. Uh, and when the new buyer takes possession of your property, those funds are returned to either you and also your lender, especially if they have a forced mortgage registered. And then whatever whatever profit is left after paying your lender back their principal plus the interest per annum, that is obviously your profit. Now, the easiest way that we've actually been able to raise money from private lenders is actually just by offering up mortgage registrations. So what that means is if a mortgage is registered uh, on title from your lender, so basically someone's giving you $300,000 to buy a home renovated, well, they can actually register a mortgage on title. And actually that is the most security. And there's a few other ways that we've done it, uh, like promissory notes or a joint venture agreement. But the most security a private lender is gonna get is by registering a mortgage on title. And that's the same way that any bank would do if they're lending you money to buy a house. Right. So the lawyer, either your lawyer or usually their lawyer will cut them a check from the sale proceeds and whatever balance is, you're going to get it. And what I've found also is when dealing with private lenders, you really want to keep them in the loop. Lenders love that. Now, again, you don't need to be calling them every single day 
you know, trying to like tell them like, hey, you know what, this is going on, on the property, we just put the drywall up and all this stuff. And I mean, again, you, you really need to know who you're working with. Some people want to know that stuff. But again, when I'm raising capital, I make that very clear uh, from people that are working with me or who I've raised capital from that, hey, you know what, I'm going to be managing the property. And you know, what you can expect is weekly progress reports. So when you have that clear expectation, you're not going to have somebody uh, reaching out to you every other day or messaging you. Uh, and again, I've had those, so I, I know you don't want that. You want to have clear expectations right from the beginning, right? Again, keeping lenders happy on a regular basis, whether you know it's a, twice a week or once a week, again, have those clear expectations. And also you want to make sure you follow up with updates, successes about the property. You know, maybe you're under budget on a property, which is awesome news. People like hearing that. So again, you know, you want to use this and you want to be able to talk to your lenders and describe things about the property as your property is going on. You're building a new house or you're flipping, whatever that is. Right. So what are some of the need to know when it comes to building a rental portfolio? So what I have found is, you know, there's obviously certain type of people that make great joint venture partners. So when I'm actually looking to raise money or use OPM to to buy real estate. And again, in the beginning, when I started investing in properties, you know, I used my own capital. I used my credit. I had a job at that time. But again, you know, at that time, that was about 12 years ago. It took me three properties based on my income at that time and some of the debt that I had at that time. Uh, that the banks tapped me out. So this is where I really started educating myself on uh, using OPM, leveraging other people's credit, cash, learning the joint venture model. So what I found is, you know, look for partners or look for JV partners when you're building a portfolio that have a desire, you know, for rental properties. So they have a desire, but they just don't have the time. They don't have the expertise and they don't have the knowledge or the team to execute that. You know, and this is one of the main reasons that we've been able to raise so much capital, uh, as well as some of the clients that we work with, is because this is where we've really positioned ourselves and our business to show value to other people. So they will put up 100% of the purchase price and the closing costs, which is 20% down at the bank. And obviously, the people that we raise money from on the rental niche, these are people that generally are uh, risk savvy, you know, they have a lower risk tolerance, and they don't want to flip houses. So just like my previous slide, you know, those people, you're obviously looking for people that are looking for you. But I and when it comes to building a rental portfolio, you want to look for people that yeah, they don't want to take, uh, they want to invest in the long term, they may have more of a long term vision. And again, they don't want to take the risks that come with associated with building homes, or uh, flipping homes for resale. And obviously educating the partners on the business. A partner might might think, you know, and again, I've had people ask me this, well, why don't I just buy the deal myself without you? And again, I have real estate investors that, you know, think the same thing and I used to also, but it's because people don't realize how much time that it really goes into finding a property, negotiating it, leasing it out, handling the day-to-day -day activities. And again, if somebody really brings up that objection to me or, hey, says, Hey, you know, Manjeet, I, I might buy a property with you, but you know, why don't I just go do it myself? Uh, it's my duty, and you know, this is where I educate people and and really tell them like what it takes to actually manage a property. And sometimes people don't realize that because their real estate knowledge has come from like watching an HGTV, you know, show on rentals, or you know, talking to Uncle Bob or their cousin about it, or you know, just really limited knowledge. Right. So, again, you need to educate them on some of the some of the value based things that you're going to be doing, like finding the property, maybe managing it in the beginning uh, in yourself or getting a third property property manager. You know, you're essentially the working partner. And this is what people want to see when you're uh, building your rental portfolio. And also what I find is I prospect people with busy lives. You know, you're going to have a lot more success working with partners that have busy lives. Uh, due to family and work and other obligations uh, than you are with people that have a lot of time. Again, that is a uh, key area where you're going to bring value, right? You are the real estate investor. You are the expert. You have the time. You have the team to really put this deal together, whether you know, you're buying a duplex or a sixplex these are things that you need to keep in mind when you're raising money from people. And also, 
what I found is, and I think this is one of the uh, biggest areas that people really fail or real estate investors that I talk to is, you know what, they might be looking for a property and I get people ask me, well, Manji, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? But it's uh, really, you need to know that you have to be prospecting and you prospecting, what I mean is raising money and you need to be looking for deals at the same times. So what I always make sure in our business, I always make sure that I have at least one to three partners pre-approved at the bank because I know you know in business and you guys have probably experienced this too that when a deal comes up you know it, it comes up fairly quick and success means acting fast so making sure that you have a few potential partners that have already gone to the bank they're already pre-approved pre-approved they have the down payment and they got the money for the closing costs ready to go so when you do find a potential rental property well then you can just give them a call and say hey uh, hey, John, you know, I just found this property. Uh, the numbers work well. We just looked at it. It has a great cap rate. There's positive cash flow on it. We're buying it under market value. Uh, you know what? Let, let's go write an offer on this house. And what I found that works so well because I've also been burned in the past when I first started and when I didn't know this stuff is I would find a property and I would, you know, want to write an offer, but then I had no capital ready to go. So then I had to go do more work, so actually put the property under contract, then go get on the phone and try to raise money from my network. It just put pressure on everybody, you know? So what I always stress people doing, especially, you know, the people that I work with, is you wanna make sure you have partners pre-approved, even if you don't have a deal. Just have them in the back of your pocket, right? So what are some of the best strategies that we've used to flip houses? Again, the, the fastest way uh, to flip a house or the, the best way to get more offers accepted, especially privately when you're private marketing is obviously cash, right? If a lender, uh, if a lender or private lender has savings in the bank account or they have some sort of other liquid money that's collecting a low rate of return, uh, we've used this type of money, which is cash to buy a property and renovate it. And again, this uh, comes back to the last Facebook Live I did. If you are in a position in your business that you have capital that you have private lenders committed to lend to you and when you're going to be negotiating these deals you're going to have a lot more options and you're going to get a lot more offers accepted guaranteed if you have lenders that are willing to give you cash and it doesn't always need to be cash sometimes it's from even from a line of credit why i use uh lines of credit or what some people call he HELOCs, and there's different names for it but a home equity line of credit is you know the idle equity the equity that's sitting in a property uh from maybe a family member or somebody that you know and what i find is that's e very easily accessible so lenders will earn a return on the difference between what you pay them and what they're paying on their line of credit whether it's attached to the house or not so if you tell tell a lender like hey you know what i'm going to give you 12 percent return per annum uh no points and the lender's paying prime plus one so maybe say three or four percent to the bank well guess what they're going to get that eight percent they're going to get that difference right and again learning how to explain this and approaching people like this it's going to put you far ahead of the competition and also home equity right people you know real estate investors don't realize that there are so many people in the marketplace that have homes paid off or they have homes also almost paid off and this could be their principal residence this could be other uh, maybe they have one or two rental properties, maybe a cottage. And a lot of this equity there, it's just sitting idle. And you know what the rich rate of return that you get on your house equity? It's actually zero. You know, it's a trick question. There's You don't actually make any money on that equity. You really capitalize on those profits when you sell the property. So again, educating people on, you know, you have your equity sitting there, but it's not really making a return. So utilizing that equity. And sometimes when you borrow money, uh, for the purposes of investing in real estate, the interest portion on that uh, line of credit or that investment becomes a tax deduction. Again, this is a question from your accountant, but this is how uh, we've done it in our business too. And again, these are things that you need to know when you're educating and approaching people, right? So to find to find out how much equity obviously is available from the bank, a lender obviously would usually need to get a house house appraisal completed, which is you know usually two to three hundred dollars. And depending on how much uh, balance is left on the mortgage, that difference is their equity. And that equity, whether it's a hundred grand, two hundred grand, 
maybe even 50 grand, well, they can utilize that to maybe fund a renovation or if they have enough of it, they can actually loan it out to you or borrow it out to you and you can go out and buy a property all cash, right? Again, depending on the market you're in. And another, another strategy that I think is totally untapped is uh, using RRSPs or other sort of registered uh, savings plans. So what these types of plans are, and I think they're so underutilized. And again, people might have heard of this strategy, but we've actually uh, gone into our market before and actually looked around that looked for people that had you know RRSPs or a RESP, which is a registered education savings plan, or a Lira, a locked in retirement account, or a LIF. So all of these registered products, uh, government products, you know, they're sitting at financial institution, whether it's RBC or uh, Quest Trade or other things, and you know a lot of these investments you know, out there that are getting subpar returns, maybe one, two, three percent, and it's very volatile. But if you can go out there, and again, with RRSPs, uh, the general rule is, you know, they need to be arm's length. So they cannot be related to you for you to borrow money from them. So keep that in mind. But you know what, if you're able to go out there, and again, that's even a bigger market. If you're approaching people that, you know, you you meet at a networking event or, or maybe in this group or, or wherever, and you know, you find out through talking to them, they have two, three, four hundred grand sitting uh, at a trust account getting a very low return. Well, then you know what? That could be a way that you can also offer them a very good return on their money and then also use that money to fund your deal. And one company that we've used before is B2B Trust. We've also used Olympia Trust, which is a trust company. And essentially what happens is if somebody has $200,000 sitting at uh, at a bank, so say uh, Royal Bank Direct Investing, you're essentially doing a transfer in kind. So you're not actually, or the lender is actually not pulling out the money directly because that would trigger tax. What you're doing is you're transferring that money from one trust company or one investment company, say RBC, over to Olympia Trust, and they actually handle the transaction. And once that money is moved over, they can be loaned to you to purchase a property. So the interest payment that you're going to pay them, whether it's you know eight, nine, 10, 12 percent, well, that interest payment goes right back into their registered account, just like it would if it was at RBC or TD, and it grows tax deferred. Again, when I'm talking about these strategies, there is so much money in the marketplace that you know what, if you really uh, focus in on one or two of these and you don't need to go and chase all this different types of uh, investments or underperforming investments if you just you know tell yourself that hey I'm just gonna start looking for people that have registered funds or I'm gonna be looking for people that have mortgages that have idle equity and if you just pick one or two strategies and just focus on that I guarantee you your business is going to blow up why because when I started really focusing in and not trying to chase every rabbit especially when I was raising money my business just got more focused more simple and guess what I got to learn more about how idle equity works how the taxation on the interest portion works when you're borrowing money from a line of credit and even how government registered funds work when i started educating myself it got me in a better position to really educate the people that i, were, I was talking to and when they saw that when they saw that i was a professional i knew what i was talking about and maybe if i didn't have the answer i knew where to get it you know it, it made it a lot easier for us to raise capital for our rental purchases right Another another area that we've also used to buy real estate is um, obviously working with banks, right? That that's the traditional route. I mean, I'm not going to spend too much time about that. I wanted to talk more, you know, how other people or how I would say, like, you know, 10 10 percent of the population in real estate buys uh, homes. So again, like I had mentioned, when you are building a rental portfolio, after your partner gets qualified at the bank for a rental purchase then you at least know what sort of property you can purchase with that person. So maybe they're approved for 200 grand or 400 or 600. Again, having one to three JV partners pre-approved at the bank is going to just help you act a lot faster. And I guarantee you're gonna get more results in your business. Again, this is gonna help you determine that. And obviously when I'm talking to uh, potential joint venture partners. Uh, I think the lowest hanging fruit is I, I just asked the partner, well, who are you already dealing with? 
because maybe they might be dealing with a bank or they have a good relationship with a credit union um, and they can just go there and get pre-approved, right? Because again, that bank or that credit union might have a very good relationship with them. So getting approved, you know, especially when it comes uh, not to buying cash, but when it comes to getting a mortgage, it is very relationship driven. And again, if your partner has a good, um, they have a good relationship with the banker, they might even get a better interest rate. In the end, that's going to help both of you win-win, right? So that is very important and keep that in mind you know, go to your existing contacts. And again, if, if it is especially with the rental properties and you're in the rental niche, go and approach people that they are already doing business with, right? And this uh, part of the presentation, guys, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time also, um, you know, over the last 12 years, I've raised over $15 million of capital. And uh, one thing I can tell you, when I first started off, um, it was just the weirdest thing for me because I would read stuff like this from books and, you know, back then, and I'm sure a lot of people have read, you know, Robert Kiyosaki's book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or Cash Flow Quadrants. And I remember reading these books from these guys and they would always talk about OPM and other people's money. And it just, it sounded so weird because first off, I, I never even had that kind of money in the beginning, but even raising that sort of money and really just approaching people it just sounded so foreign to me but you know over the span of over a decade now and having raised money from tons uh, of different people you know either in my network or people that i've been referred to uh, i've learned a lot of lessons and i'm going to share some of these lessons with you so again if you guys got a pen and paper jot it down because i am going to go fairly quick here because i want to make sure uh, that i'm respecting everyone's time here on the call uh, one of them is accessibility so when you're starting out, when you're raising money, uh, the easiest and fastest way to find your first lender is again going to be in your inner circle. So your family and your friends. Why? It's because it's this is relationship based, right? And I, I, I'm pretty sure some of you guys are thinking as well. I don't have nobody in my family has money. And again, I thought the same thing. I was like, well, you know, my uh, my family. I think I know them. I think I know their numbers, uh, even though I didn't. I was just making judgments. I thought they had money, but uh, sorry, I thought they didn't have money. And it wasn't until I actually started approaching them and just started sharing a little bit about, you know, my excitement for real estate, why I was excited and, you know, what I was planning to do. And it wasn't until I started asking at least that I started finding out that, you know, some of those people that I thought had no capital or, you know, they had no equity or whatnot, because again, I was just making assumptions. I found out that a lot of them did. You know, and and that's that could be the same for you, because even if they might not have it, you know what, they might know five, 10, 20 other people that they can refer you to. So, again, if you're raising money and I've talked about this in a previous uh, Facebook Live, you want to start with your inner circle. And what I found, too, is when you are raising money, you need to be educating. You need to put on your hat and think of yourself uh, not just you know, from your own perspective that you're a real estate investor and you just want money, you need to be educating these people because a lot of people, first off, they're not even educated on real estate. They've maybe heard of real estate investing and, you know, obviously most people have, uh, but they don't know how it works. So there are obviously types of individuals that have access to capital, but they have no idea that they can loan money to an investor like you and get a good return. Most people think they can just take their money uh, in the bank or in GICs or stocks or investments or bonds. And again, majority of the money in Canada is at the bank, right? Again, we, even with RRSPs, a uh, lot of money in GICs and people don't even think outside the box like, oh, I can actually invest it with somebody locally who buys real estate and even get a better return. And again, from my experience, people don't know this. So again, this is where you're going to educate them. So the more you learn about investing strategies, and I have this in brackets because this is a presentation I wanna do later on, but I'm gonna be breaking down different types of investments in the marketplace and showing you how they work. Uh, because the more you know about them and the what types of returns they make, whether it's interest, dividends, or capital gains, the better you are gonna be at your business. So again, the more success you will achieve. And the other thing that I found is you have to be consistent. You know, there, there will be potential lenders that you talk to. And you know, a lot of them, I would say, again, to be quite honest, a lot of them are gonna say no. 
right? And that doesn't matter because even if they say no, it's not a no forever. It might just not be the right timing, right? So sometimes, again, not right now, right? So timing is everything when you're raising money. And I can tell you stories of when I uh, approached, uh, you know, I approached people in my family, like my cousin, I actually approached them uh, two years before he actually decided to work with me. And it was, and, and for him, what it was is he just wanted to kind of see me, um, you know, doing my business, making sure that I know what I was doing, that I was serious. But you know what I did at the same time? I didn't just wait around two years to wait for him to give me money to go buy real estate. I just kept at it. I kept raising money from other people. And when the timing came for him, well, guess what? He called me and we ended up doing four flips together, right? So again, you want to make sure that you are just consistent. And the biggest thing is being persistent when you are raising capital or if you want to use OPM for growing your business. And, and again, at the end of the day, some will never invest, right? There, there's going to be individuals who just never will invest no matter your experience level, the return you provide, the deal you have. Some people just have a low, a very low risk of tolerance, which is totally fine. And again, you know, if it doesn't work for them, that's fine, right? At the end of the day, again, like in any sales, um, you know, this is a numbers game. You wanna go find more deals, it's a numbers game. You wanna find, uh, you wanna get more offers accepted, more, write more offers, it's a numbers game. And that's the same thing when it comes to raising capital. And what I found is also you need to go meta. And what I mean by that is you really, when you are sitting with people, you need to ask these lenders the right questions about their current portfolio, their dislikes about investment, their likes about investment. Uh, what are they looking for in a return? You know, people, if you ask them the right questions, uh, and what I call this a KYC or know your client when I was a financial planner uh, is you need to really know your client because the, the information that they give you, this is going to give you ammunition to actually go and close this deal with your private, with your potential lender or JV partner, right? So you need to dig deep and really find out what your lender's goals are, what their desires are, what are their fears about investing? If they had a bad experience before, well, how was it? and really address these issues with yourself, your business, um, you know, your experience, if you have some, and all of these things, right? So you need to really learn who you're working with. And again, I've mentioned this before on training, you don't want everybody's capital. If somebody has, you know, a million bucks or half a million dollars, but you just feel after like getting to know them that they're just going to be a headache to work with, well, move on, right? I can tell you that I've raised money from people and, and thinking back at it, I didn't qualify them enough and they were just a pain in the butt, right? Uh, so again, there's a lot of money out there that you just need to be aware of that when you're raising it. And, and again, you know, I love, I love this, right? But asking and receiving, if you don't ask, you're not going to get commitments. So you could know someone for years and have them very well aware of your business and they will never invest with you unless you ask. And I, I can tell you there's been people in my circle that they're just friends that I know. And you know what? I never really even talked to them about investing and, and they all, they were all aware of what I did. And I remember at two, uh, two occasions with two of them, you know, at one time I just decided I was looking for capital and I thought, I'm like, hey, you know, what? I just thought, thought I'd throw it out there. They already know what I'm doing. And, you know, these two people ended up doing business with me because I just planted that seed, right? Power of suggestion. I planted it and I would have never known if I just didn't ask. Um, the other thing I also I've learned is, you know, the edification model or the power of edification. So if you are asking someone for a referral, so you have somebody, uh, maybe you've talked to them about lending to you, maybe it's not right for them, but then you ask them for a referral to their market. You want to make sure that that person, if they're going to refer you to someone in their market, they need to edify you before that call. The positive image, the referral sees in their mind of you, their business, your character, and what their contact shared with them about you, the higher success rate is you're gonna have when you go call them and you approach them and talk to them. And this is huge. Anytime I get a referral from somebody on social media or just you know in my current network because they know what I do and they say, hey Manji, like I know this person, uh, you know, they've talked about investing. I just kind of gave them, I talked to them about you. Well, I call that person, I talk to them. And, and before I do that, I make sure my friend edifies me. 
because I want to make sure I'm walking on water when I call that person. And because if they have a positive image in their mind from that referral, the person that connected us to, it's going to make your business and your closing rate a lot higher. And also answering your lenders uh, questions. And this is the biggest thing I, I've really learned with raising money. No funds will ever be raised until you are able to answer all of your lenders' questions, concerns, uh, objections, whatever you call it. They need to have a clear understanding of how this transaction is going to work in their mind uh, before they commit and they move forward. And I've I've been in so many sales meetings, whether you know it's raising money, whether it's negotiating a deal, and the the biggest ones I've learned is. If I ask them a question and I really need to listen, but the, the bigger thing is when they're asking me questions, I know that shows that they are interested because they're obviously answering. But what I've learned is if they're asking me a question, I just need to answer and shut up. I don't need to say anything extra because people really need to process information on these, on these uh, meetings, whether you're presenting them a deal, your credibility package that you might have put up on your, on your possible deal you're raising money for. Uh, but the biggest thing is they need to have a clear, clear idea. And so if you, they're asking you a question, you need to use silence and really learn how to use silence. Uh, because at the end of the day, when you are raising money, I mean, it is a bit of a negotiation. It can be because they might be asking for 15% interest. You might be only offering 10% interest. So again, uh, these are things that you just really need to study sales and the psychology of sales to get better. And again, at the end of the day, you're not, you don't want to be salesy with people that you're raising money from. Uh, but there are ways that you can push a little bit when you think you need to and also pull back. And again, at the end of the day, this comes from experience. Right. And uh, one other thing or a few other things here is rinse and repeat. You don't need hundreds of lenders. So let me get that straight. You don't need to have 30, 40, 50 people lending you money, especially $20,000 only each. You just need a handful of investors. Maybe it's five, maybe it's 10. And for us, there's about uh, maybe about 15 different people that we do most of our business with. Right. And I would really say the 20 percent, there's only probably five or six of them that have a lot of capital. And you know what? We just rinse and repeat their money, pay them back. And, and again, why I say that is because you don't need to raise money from tons of people. You can work with a few and again, use them over and over again and work with them, especially uh, if you're buying real estate, you're paying them back. Well, they're going to want to invest with you again. Right. So once you can show them that you can pay them back, they are going to keep working with you. But more importantly, they might even refer people in their network. So when you're also raising money, what I have found is if it's a, a wife, husband team or, or whatever, like their spouses involved, you need to have all the decision makers at that meeting. Right. These to even drum up a meeting with somebody takes a lot of time and energy. And what I have found is when you're sitting down with lenders who have a spouse, uh, you need to ask them if they are going to be a decision maker. And these are huge decisions when people are giving you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They need to be there. And if they are, you want to make sure at that meeting, you you don't leave that meeting unless you book a follow up call to get an answer, whether they're moving forward or not. You know, this is not a this is not a business of maybe you either want a yes or a no on these uh, on these calls. Uh, especially when you're, whether even if you're writing an offer and you're putting a deadline or you're raising money from somebody, you need to make sure that you use time uh, to negotiate these types of transactions. And, and also the biggest thing is get those decisions, right? So again, at these calls, make sure all the decision makers are there. And sometimes it's not even a spouse. I might raise money uh, from people that, you know, they might be like 30 years old or somebody pretty young. And uh, but you know what? They value their uncle's opinion or whatever. And they've told me that or through, you know, through my qualifying. Well, I'm going to make sure that that uncle is present at that meeting because I'm not going to go do a presentation and then go ask to do it again. And again, why I'm saying this is because I did this in the beginning without qualifying them. And this is what I've learned over time is you need to have the decision makers there. And when it comes to raising money from your family and friends, you need to be very cautious. You need to be cautious in general, but really when it comes to your family and friends, because you know if a deal goes sideways, and obviously it can when you're dealing in real estate, 
you don't want that relationship to be affected. So you want to really make sure that if people like your mom or your dad or whoever is investing with you that's related to you, they need to understand the risks in detail. And the biggest thing is you want everything on paper. You know, it's it's so tempting not to do that because you're like, oh, I just trust this person. Like, or more so, they trust you and they're just going to go off a handshake or because they know you. And I mean, the weird, crazy thing is obviously money does weird things to people. And I've seen that. So you want to make sure you're really cautious. Doesn't matter why they can be your mom. You want it in paper. Right. Um, and that that's one thing that is just going to save you a lot of headache, especially when someone comes back and says, well, no, no, that's not what we agreed upon. Or I thought it was this or I thought it was that. Right. This is why you want it on papers. And and also really know that uh, lenders, some lenders might just ask for too much when you're raising money. So if a lender <clears throat> wants more piece of the pie than you can give in a deal, just know that there are a lot more people out there that you can approach. So you don't need to commit to a lender or a JV partner if those numbers, uh, if the numbers that they're wanting uh, or the return that they're wanting or the equity share interest that they're wanting works for you, right? If it doesn't work for you or it doesn't work for them, well, then walk away. There's a lot of money out there. And again, you never want to be desperate or come off as being desperate on these calls because I guarantee you're not going to raise any money, right? So these are you know some of the the best lessons that i've learned over the years and uh, i really hope you know you guys apply them to to your um your business right and, and at the end of the day uh, i always mention this like i can give you guys all the knowledge and you can read everything from books or youtube videos but at the end of the day obviously you want to have the right education but the biggest thing is you want to practice, you want to fail, you are going to fail, and you want to learn, and then you just rinse and repeat what works and what doesn't work, right? And again, when it comes to what I've learned, there are a lot of other things when it comes to real estate, like obviously learning what to say on these calls, right? And really uh, having a script, which we use in our business or what we do and we show others to you know, use scripts so you know how to answer people's most common objections or answers. Obviously, you don't want to sound scripted, but you want to make sure you do that. And obviously, coming down to the paperwork, right? So there's obviously a lot of stuff uh, on this webinar or on this Facebook Live that uh, a lot of other things that I could share. But again, I'm not going to be spending two, three, four hours on the call because, again, everybody has stuff to do. But you know what? If you guys are interested or anybody on the call is interested uh, in getting on the phone with myself or my team and you want to learn a little bit more about our process, systematically how we do things and how we put things in order, uh, you know what? Feel free to book us uh, on a call. And again, you know what, if we can share a little bit of insight of how our system and our process works for raising money all the way from actually approaching somebody and using the right legal documents to getting money committed to your business, you know what, feel free to reach out to, you, uh, reach out to us. You know, this will probably be the best, um, the th best 30, 45 minutes you've ever spent on your business this year. If we can even map out uh, what has really helped us and a lot of the people on our team really excel their business, you know, raise their first 300, 400. And sometimes even some people raised a million dollars of capital and had their business blown off. And if we can add a little bit of value to uh, anybody in the group, you know what, we're looking to do that, right? 